2014 is a year of enormous change for Formula One. It's almost easy to ask what hasn't changed. Uh, we've got changes in the sporting regulations, changes in the technical regulations, change of driver lineup, uh, change of scoring points. Everything is different. But if I just paraphrase some of that, in the sporting uh, regulations. We've got two exciting circuits for this year that we haven't raced on before in the Austria, what used to be called the A1 ring, uh, and in Russia. Our driver lineup has changed because we have Kevin Magnussen uh, sitting alongside Jensen Button as former world champion, and that's a really exciting proposition for us. Technically, engine and chassis, if I just break those two down, that's all different. The engine is no longer a 2.4 litre V8, it's a 1.6 litre uh, V6 engine with a very complicated energy recovery system. Not just braking energy, but now uh, heat energy from the turbocharger and a huge ba lithium ion battery in the middle of it as well. Uh, that means that the gearbox is going to be different, so seven ratios, it's eight ratios. Uh, there are only five engines that have got to last you this season uh, and heavy penalties for failure. A gearbox has got to last six races, uh, so that's most of the transmission. If I then go to the chassis, uh, aerodynamically it's all different. The front wing is narrower and the front wing end plates conveniently run straight into the front wheel, which is a nightmare for the aerodynamicists. Uh, the rear lower main plane has disappeared, so the aerodynamics are all different. Um, the engine people want us to carry huge amounts of radiator uh, uh, cooling to cool this engine and turbocharger. That's complicated. It's 50 kilos more weight on the car. Uh, because of all the complex systems that go with it. We can only screw up fuel in at 100 kilos, maximum fuel load of 100 kilos per hour, and that's measured. And on top of all that, we're limited in what we can do in the wind tunnel by the sporting regulations as well. So what's not to like? Quite busy over the next few months as you prepare for new season. I think the, um, the busiest things for it, whenever you have a, what feels like a complete reset in, in the regulations, everybody starts from ground zero. There is no no carryover, no evolution of the concept from last year to, to next year. So it's a clean sheet of paper. Um, if you imagine that uh, a car is typically you know, 13 or 14,000 parts uh, and we're all out in the supply chain and all making bits over the winter. Bear in mind, we only finished racing at the end of, end of November last year and here we are at the end of January ready to launch another 14,000 parts. So for the designers, the production guys, it's just a huge logistics uh, challenge. Um, but with, these, uh, with the new powertrain and all of that complexity within it, reliability is going to be absolutely key, um, both managing heat and, and managing just this very early, uh, very exciting technology, but stuff that we don't yet know about. So for the first quarter, I think we've got our hands full, just making sure we can get these things to race properly. And as much as anything, I guess, the base from which you guys could work. It is. The first thing we need to make sure is that the car that we think we've built, which is modelled in the simulator and in the wind tunnel and a variety of our, our uh, mathematical models, is the car that's on the circuit. Once we know where we're at and we've got a, got a baseline we can compare to everybody else, then we know uh, what it is that we have to do. So hopefully we'll be up there or thereabouts, but nobody's going to be confident at this time of year. Um, that's where probably the, the real championship will come from. I think it'll be a really exciting season. You know, I think if we go back to... Um, Formula One in the early part of the, of the 2000s, then um, you know, Formula One's e evolved enormously in terms of reliability. We've still got the pace, still got the drama, still got all of the jeopardy that a sporting uh, a feature has to have. But we've had amazing reliability brought on by some of the changes in the regulations. And I think we're going to take a big reset on that. It's a huge challenge for everybody. Um, that will make some really exciting races because there are going to be some thrills and some spills. Uh, and that unpredictability always adds a bit of, uh, bit of drama if you're sitting in the armchair at home and watching it across a bar or something. And a bit of stress if you're trying to run a Formula One team. So, but we're up for that. We've got a team that are very strong people and a lot of specialist know-how here. And it's a team of racers. So uh, we relish the challenge. Um, that's a car change is something like 2,000 well, times a season or something. Yeah, the, the development process in Formula 1 is always frenetic. You have to remember that you know, we don't make one car a year and then go and race it. A car is constantly changing on a race-by-race -race basis. And the grid has evolved to such an extent now that when the regulations are mature, you're probably looking at between a tenth and a tenth and a half of a second uh, per lap improvement from race to race just to stand still. So if you're not developing the car, actually you're going backwards. But with this level of immaturity and newness in both chassis and engine regulations, and to some extent sporting regulations, how do we use the constrained energy that we have to best effect across a race distance? There's a huge amount of learning, so I would expect that development curve to be much steeper this year. Um, 
And from Michael, of course, Honda 2015. Yeah, I think um, one thing about uh, Formula One is, is, as I said at the beginning, things are constantly in a state of flux and change, whether that's within the regulations, whether it's emerging technology, whether it's the organisation. Uh, and nothing stands still and it can't afford to. You know, the, um, the white heat of competition that is Formula One racing puts enormous pressure uh, on, on organisations. And these teams have got good over the last 10 years. So to earn your corn, you have to work really, really hard. So in terms of organisation, we're pushing very hard to strengthen uh, in all areas, both in the trackside uh, community. Obviously, in the last few years, we brought Sam Michael in. Uh, this year, in our engineering organisation, we brought Matt Morris in, who was technical director at Sauber. We're strengthening our aerodynamic team all the time. Some, some big signings there, like Peter Padromu, uh, and some very talented people who will be known in the industry, like Dan Fallows and Ettore Graffini. Um, and there are stars here, and there are stars coming in, but it's, it's that squad culture and, and that work ethic and that sense that we're here to win. That's what attracts the great people, and that's what will retain them here. And we are about winning. Um, which will certainly well this year. We're, I mean, we're really fortunate with our driver lineups uh, here, but Jensen's no exception to that. As a former world champion, uh, he's driven good cars, bad cars, intermediate cars, and, and he's so articulate as anybody who's interviewed him and listened to him will attest. His, his feedback and his insight into what's going on in the car is extremely useful to us. Um, he's a consummate racer, as we've seen, uh, and all the drivers are going to have to adapt because driving these cars with a very different torque profile, uh, low down in the, the RPM range with very different aerodynamic characteristics, they're going to have to learn fast. And you don't get to be world champion if you can't adapt and, and put a season together. So, so that's proven in Jensen's case. Um, and he's up for the fight. He's been away getting fit over the, the winter. But if I look at um, Kevin as an exciting prospect, then he has that, uh, that freshness, that youth, that almost adaptability. He doesn't have a preconceived idea about what it's like to be in a Formula One car. So he has no, no benchmark or no previous experience to, to give him besetting sins, if you will. And he has that youth and adaptability and a real hunger, as they all do uh, when they come in. And we just need to make sure that we, uh, we unleash that when it's appropriate and we shelter him from some of the fierceness and white heat of the, the other parts of Formula One. Uh, I agree with you. I think that um, if ever there was a time to come into Formula One and, and start on a level playing field, this is it. Because, as I described earlier, everything is, is different. Um, he, he is so hungry for this, though. He's worked so hard. We have had him in the, in the Formula One car in, in previous incarnations here, testing for us. And he's done a, he's done a fantastic job, eye-opening in some cases, when we've seen him in the, in the tests uh, and what kind of pace he can put in relative to, uh, to the majority of the grid. He's earned his place to have a go, um, but under no illusions that anybody who comes into Formula One as a young driver, you, you haven't arrived, you've been given an opportunity and you have to demonstrate that over that first two or three years and build that consistency, build the confidence um, and build the ability to adapt and recover because things do go wrong. Final question, what's going to be the difference between success and failure this year? For me, I think certainly in the first six months, it's about speed of decision making because things are going to happen. It's all new, it's changing, um, and nobody can afford to sit still and ponder. You've got to see something and move quickly, whether that's reliability to capture points or race wins early in the season, whether it's to spot a technological advantage, or whether it's to spot that something on the competition uh, is useful or to adapt to a reinterpretation by the FIA, who knows? Um, but speed of decision making will be key. Um, well, Ron's back is an interesting interpretation because Ron never went uh, anywhere, but he's certainly back in the chief executive seat. And for those that, that know Ron, um, he's as fired up as he, as he ever has been, probably more passionate now than ever. Uh, he's excited about the changes that we have ahead of us. Uh, he's very operational with us in the business um, and has a very strong vision about the brand, the values, and not just about making sure that McLaren is totally focused on winning, but how we win. You know, there is that, that way that McLaren go about things. And if ever there was somebody who had a very strong vision and a, and a sense of true north uh, and how it, how it is to win in Formula One and why that's important, he's got it in spades. So it's exciting times.